Chapter Three of Fast in the Ice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fast in the Ice by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Three. In the Ice: Dangers of Arctic Voyaging. Next morning, the hope was becalmed in the midst of a scene more beautiful than the tongue or pen of man can describe. When the sun rose that day, it shone upon what appeared to be a field of glass and a city of crystal. Every trace of the recent storm was gone except a long swell, which caused the brig to roll considerably, but which did not break the surface of the sea. Ice was to be seen all around as far as the eye could reach, ice in every form and size imaginable. And the wonderful thing about it was that many of the masses resembled the buildings of a city. There were houses and churches, and monuments and spires and ruins. There were also islands and mountains. Some of the pieces were low and flat, no bigger than a boat. Others were tall with jagged tops. Some of the fields, as they were called, were a mile and more in extent, and there were a number of bergs or ice mountains higher than the brig's topmasts. These were almost white, but they had in many places a greenish blue color that was soft and beautiful. The whole scene shone and sparkled so brilliantly in the morning sun that one could almost fancy it was one of the regions of fairyland. When young Gregory came on the quarter deck, no one was there except Jim Croft, a short, thick set man, with the legs of a dwarf and the shoulders of a giant. He stood at the helm, and although no steering was required, as there was no wind, he kept his hands on the spokes of the wheel, and glanced occasionally at the compass. The first mate who had the watch on deck was up at the masthead, observing the state of the ice. How glorious! exclaimed the youth, as he swept his sparkling eye round the horizon. Ah, oh, Croft, is it not splendid? So it is, said the seaman, turning the large quid of tobacco that bulged out his left cheek. It is very beautiful, no doubt, but it's coming rather thick for my taste. How so? inquired Gregory. There seems to me plenty of open water to enable us to steer clear of these masses, Besides, as we have no wind, it matters little, I should think, whether we have room to sail or not. You've not seen much of the ice, that's plain, said Croft, else you'd know that the floes are closing around us, and we'll soon be fast in the pack, if a breeze don't spring up to help us. As the reader may not, perhaps, understand the terms used by Arctic voyagers in regard to the ice in its various forms, it may be as well here to explain the meaning of those most commonly used. When ice is seen floating in small detached pieces and scattered masses, it is called flow ice, and men speak of getting among the flows. When these flows close up, so that the whole sea seems to be covered with them, and little water can be seen, it is called pack ice. When pack ice is squeezed together, so that lumps of it are forced up in the form of rugged mounds, these mounds are called hummocks. A large mass of flat ice, varying from one mile to many miles in extent, is called a field, and a mountain of ice is called a berg. All the ice here spoken of except the berg is sea ice, formed by the freezing of the ocean in winter. The berg is formed in a very different manner. Of this more shall be said in a future chapter. "'Well, my lad,' said Gregory, in reply to Jim Croft's last observation, "'I have not seen much of the ice yet, as you truly remark, so I hope that the wind will not come to help us out of it for some time. You don't think it dangerous to get into the pack, do you?' "'Well, not exactly dangerous, sir,' replied Croft. "'but I must say that it ain't safe, "'specially when there's a swell on like this. "'But that'll go down soon. "'Do you know what a nip is, Dr. Gregory?' "'I think I do. "'At least I have read of such a thing. "'But I should be very glad to hear what you have to say about it. "'No doubt you have felt one.' "'Felt one?' cried Jim, "'screwing up his face and drawing his limbs together, "'as if he were suffering horrible pain. "'No, I've never felt one.' The man what feels a nip ain't likely to live to tell what his feelings was. 
but I've seed one. You've seen one, have you? That must have been interesting. Where was it? Not very far from the Greenland coast, said Croft, giving his quid another turn. This was the way of it. You must know that there was two ships of us in company at the time. Whalers we was. We got into the heart of the pack somehow, and we thought we'd never get out of it again. There was nothing but ice all around us as far as the eye could see. The name of our ship was the Nancy. Our comrade was the Bullfinch. One morning, early, we heard a loud noise of ice rubbing again the side of the ship. So we all jumped up and on deck as fast as we could, for there is short time given to save ourselves in them seas sometimes. The whole pack we found was in motion, and a wide lead of water opened up before us, for all the world like a smooth river or canal winding through the pack. Into this we warped the ship, and hoisting sail steered away cheerily. We passed close to the bullfinch, which was still hard and fast in the pack, and we saw that her crew was sawing and cutting away at the ice, trying to get into the lead that we got into. So we hailed them, and said we'd wait for them outside the pack, if we got through. But the words were no sooner spoken when the wind, it died away, and we were becalmed about half a mile from the bullfinch. "'You'd better go down to breakfast, boys,' says our captain. "'Says he, the breeze won't be long a coming again.' So down the men went, and soon after that the steward comes on deck, and says he to the captain, "'Breakfast, sir.' "'Very good,' says the captain, and down he went too, leaving me at the wheel and the mate in charge of the deck. He'd not been gone three minutes when I noticed that the great field of ice on our right was closing in on the field on our left, and the channel we was floatin' in was closin' up. The mate noticed it too, but he wouldn't call the captain, cause the ice came so slowly and quietly on that for a few minutes we could hardly believe it was movin', and everything around us looked so calm and peaceful that it was difficult to believe our danger was so great. But this was only a momentary feeling, d'ye see. A minute after that, the mate he cries down to the captain, "'Ice closing up, sir!' "'And the captain, he runs on deck. "'By this time there was no mistake about it. "'The ice was close upon us. "'It was clear that we were to have a nip. "'So the captain roars down the hatchway. "'Tumble up there, tumble up! "'Every man alive! "'For your lives!' "'And sure enough they did tumble up, "'as I'd never seen them do it before. Two or three of them was sick. "'They came up with their clothes in their hands. "'The ice was now almost touching our sides.' "'And I can tell you, sir, I never did feel so queerish in all my life before "'as when I looked over the edge at the side of that great field of ice "'which rose three foot out of the water, "'and was, I suppose, six foot more below the surface. "'It came on so slowly that we could hardly see the motion. "'Inch by inch the water narrowed between it and our sides. "'At last it touched on the left side.' and that shoved us quicker on to the field on our right. Every eye was fixed on it. Every man held his breath. You might have heard a pin fall on the deck. It touched gently at first. Then there was a low, grinding and crunching sound. The ship trembled as if it had been a living creature, and the beams began to crack. Now you must know, sir, that when a nip of this sort takes a ship, the ice usually eases off, after giving her a good squeeze, or when the pressure is too much for her, the ice slips under her bottom and lifts her right out of the water. But our Nancy was what we call wall-sided. She was never fit to sail in them seas. The consequence was that the ice crushed her sides in. The moment the captain heard the beams begin to go, he knew it was all up with the ship. He roared to take to the ice for our lives. You may be sure we took his advice. Over the side we went, every man jack of us, and got on the ice. We did not take time to save an article belonging to us, and it was as well we did not, for the ice closed up with a crash, and we heard the beams and timbers rending like a fire of musketry in the hold. Her bottom must have been cut clean away, for she stood on the ice just as she had floated on the sea. Then the noise stopped, the ice eased off, and the ship began to settle. The lead of water opened up again. In ten minutes after that, the Nancy went to the bottom, and left us standing there on the ice. It was the mercy of God that let it happen so near the bullfinch. 
We might have been out of sight of that ship at the time, and then every man of us would have been lost. As it was, we had a hard scramble over a good deal of loose ice, jumping from lump to lump, and some of us falling into the water several times before we got aboard. Now that was a bad nip, sir, weren't it? It certainly was, replied Gregory, and although I delight in being among the ice, I sincerely hope that our tight little brig may not be tried in the same way. But she is better able to stand it, I should think. That she is, sir, replied Croft, with much confidence. I seed her in dock, sir, when they was a puttin' of extra timbers on the bow, and I do believe she would stand twice as much bad usage as the Nancy got, though she is only half the size. Jim Croft's opinion on this point was well founded, for the hope had indeed been strengthened and prepared for her ice battles with the greatest care by men of experience and ability. As some readers may be interested in this subject, I shall give a brief account of the additions that were made to her hull. The vessel was nearly two hundred tons burden. She had originally been built very strongly and might even have ventured on a voyage to the polar seas, just as she was. But Captain Harvey resolved to take every precaution to ensure the success of his voyage, and the safety and comfort of his men. He therefore had the whole ship's bottom sheathed with thick hardwood planking, which was carried up above her water-line as high as the ordinary floe-ice would be likely to reach. The hull inside was strengthened with stout cross-beams, as well as with beams running along the length of the vessel, and in every part that was likely to be subjected to pressure, iron stanchions were fastened. But the bow of the vessel was the point where the utmost strength was aimed at. Inside, just behind the cutwater, the whole space was so traversed by cross-beams of oak that it almost became a solid mass and outside the sharp stem was cased in iron so as to resemble a giant's chisel. The false keel was taken off, the whole vessel in short was rendered as strong outside and in as wood and iron and skill could make her. It need scarcely be said that all the other arrangements about her were made with the greatest care and without regard to expense, for although the owners of the brig did not wish to waste their money, they set too high a value on human life to risk it for the sake of saving a few pounds. She was provisioned for a cruise of two years and a half. But this was in case of accidents, for Captain Harvey did not intend to be absent much longer than one year. But to return to our story. Jim Croft's fear that they would be set fast was realized sooner than he had expected. The flows began to close in from no cause that could be seen, for the wind was quite still, and in a short time the loose ice pressed against the hope on all sides. It seemed to young Gregory as if the story that the seaman had just related was about to be enacted over again, and being a stranger to ice he could not help feeling a little uneasy for some time. But there was in reality little or no danger, for the pressure was light, and the brig had got into a small bay in the edge of an ice-field, which lay in the midst of the smaller masses. Seeing that there was little prospect of the pack opening up just then, the captain ordered the ice-anchors to be got out and fixed. The appearance of the sea from the brig's deck was now extremely wintry, but very bright and cheerful. Not a spot of blue water was to be seen in any direction. The whole ocean appeared as if it had been frozen over. It was now past noon, and the sun's rays were warm, although the quantity of ice around rendered the air cold. As the men were returning from fixing the anchors, the captain looked over the side and said, "'It's not likely that we shall move out of this for some hours. What say you, lads, to a game of football?' The proposal was received with a loud cheer. The ball had been prepared by the sailmaker in expectation of some such opportunity as this. It was at once tossed over the side. Those men who were not already on the field scrambled out of the brig, and the entire crew went leaping and yelling over the ice with the wild delight of schoolboys let loose for an unexpected holiday. 
They were in the middle of the game when a loud shout came from the brig, and the captain's voice was heard singing out, "'All hands ahoy! Come aboard! Look alive!' Instantly the men turned, and there was a general race toward the brig, which lay nearly a quarter of a mile distant from them. In summer, changes in the motion of the ice-pack took place in the most unexpected manner. Currents in the ocean are, no doubt, the chief cause of these. The action of winds has also something to do with them. One of these changes was now taking place. Almost before the men got on board, the ice had separated, and long canals of water were seen opening up here and there. Soon after that, a light breeze sprang up. The ice anchors were taken aboard, the sails trimmed, and soon the Hope was again making her way slowly but steadily to the north. End of chapter 3